1914, a young man named Henry Garlock felt called to ministry. He had a passion to go to the mission field of Africa. But when he told his father, his father said, you can't leave me. They were farmers, and his father relied upon Henry to help plant and harvest the crop. And so they made an agreement. His father said, if you'll serve me for another three years, then I will release you to go to the Bible school. So Henry worked for three years, and finally the day came when his father released him to go to Bible school. He was so excited to pursue the call of God and finally received training. But after he'd been there for just a few weeks, he received a letter in the mail. Remember, in those days, there were no mobile phones or internet. And the letter came in the mail, and when he opened it, he was shocked to say that it was from his mother. He said, son, your father is ill. Your brother is ill. The crops need to be harvested. I'm begging you, come home now, or our family will face disaster. Well, Henry agonized in prayer. He didn't know what to do. He spent the night in prayer seeking God. He knew he'd heard from God. He knew he had a call. He knew he'd stepped out in faith, and now he'd received this letter. But what if he didn't go back? What would happen to his family? What would he do? In the morning, the Holy Spirit spoke to him. After struggling in prayer all night, after drawing close to Jesus, the Holy Spirit led him to open his Bible to Luke 9, 62. And there he found this. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Henry got up from the place of prayer and dressed himself and went to the canteen for breakfast. When he got there and sat down to eat, a friend came and said, Henry, the Lord spoke to me to give you a verse. In Luke 9, 62, Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Then they went to chapel after breakfast, and a guest speaker arose and said, Today I'm preaching from Luke 9, 62. No man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And Henry Garlock went back to his hostel and wrote a letter and said, Mom, I care, and Mom, I'm concerned, and Mom, I'll be praying, but I am not coming home because Jesus has called me, and no man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. With a heavy heart, he posted the letter, not knowing what would happen. And then in a few weeks, he received a letter in reply. He eagerly tore it open and got an answer that made his heart rejoice. For his mother said, Henry, God has answered us. Your dad is improving. Your brother is improving. Your neighbors have come to help us. Everything is okay. Don't come home. Stay where you are and serve the Lord. And so Henry Garlock did just that. In fact, he graduated from Bible college and went on to be a famous missionary right here in West Africa. He planted churches in Liberia and Ghana beginning in 1920, and he served the Lord faithfully along with his family. In fact, his son, John Garlock, was my homiletics professor in Bible school who taught me how to preach. There's a powerful lesson for all of us in the inspiring true story of Henry Garlock. The truth is, Henry Garlock succeeded in ministry because he learned to press on no matter what the circumstances looked like. He learned to never give up, but to persevere even in times of trial, even in times of opposition. Even when it seemed like his heart was broken and he couldn't go on, he was committed to the call. He kept going, and God kept going with him. I think we need his inspiration now more than ever. We're facing dark days in the world and dark days in the church. It seems that many different oppositions have come against us, beginning with COVID and uncertainty in the world and economic difficulties. But God wants to encourage you today, for he didn't call you to start and stop. He didn't call you to put your hand to the plow and look back. He didn't call you to go halfway. He called you to go all the way and to press on to finish. And I want to encourage you today press on somebody say press on I want to share God's word with you in three ways we need to press on but before we do bow your heads with me in prayer almighty and everlasting father we thank you for this gathering this lead conference we've come at an hour when your church needs to hear from you when the men and women you've called to lead your people will arise with the power of the holy ghost and the grace of god and i pray that you will stir in us today that we will hear your voice that we will feel your motivation we will receive your grace and we will get the truth we need to run our race 
and press on. I submit to you now, each and every one of us, I bind the voice of the devil that would come to steal the seed of the word out of our hearts, every spirit that would deceive or disturb or distract us. I bind you in the name of Jesus, and I loose the spirit of the living God. I loose the spirit of the Almighty to fall upon our hearts, to revive us and quicken us anew and afresh. And I thank you by faith that at the end of today and the end of this conference, we will be strengthened and blessed and the world will know you met with us here. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name and everybody said amen. I want to invite you to join your faith with mine right now. Go ahead and put your hand on your chest and pray after me. Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lead Conference 2022. It's great to have you here in the house. We say a big welcome to all of you. I love you. I'm proud of you. And we are here for you. For a long time, I've wanted to have a conference like this where we just gathered family and friends. This isn't a public conference. We didn't go out on Sunny FM or on TV or newspaper to advertise. We invited friends, and through word of the mouth, others have come, and we're glad that you're here. We love you, and we are for you. And I want to say a few things before I get into my message a little bit more. First of all, here at Lead Conference, this is a no-condemnation zone. Amen. Amen. This is a no-condemnation zone. You're free here. If you've got a problem, you can let us know. We're here to pray for you. We're here to help you. There is no condemnation. Tell your neighbor there's no condemnation. It's a no condemnation. No, not only that, this is a, a no competition zone. Amen? We're not here to compete with each other. I want you to be blessed. I want your ministry to succeed. I want you to pull crowd. I want you to do great exploits for the kingdom. I want God to elevate you so you can make Jesus famous. I'm not competing with anybody in this room. We're not competing with one another. If you tell me something about how God is moving, I'm going to rejoice with you. I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to ask you to lay hands on me and pray for me. Hallelujah. And this is a no criticism zone. You know, you go to some gatherings and they're all about, did you see that car he came in? <laughs> Did you see the way he dressed? They're all critical of one another. This is a no criticism zone. We love you. We accept you. Because the fact is we all need to change. Every one of us, myself included, we all need to change. I've been in ministry since 1977, and I've still got a long way to go. I'm hoping I get there before I die. Amen. We need to grow because God has more for us. In fact, that's what our scripture text for today tells us. If you see it at the top of your notes, Philippians 3, let's read it all together. Ready, go. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Listen to the words of Paul, the great apostle here. He's telling us that there's something more. And when I read this passage, I'm always amazed because I consider who wrote these words. This is the greatest apostle who ever lived apart from Jesus Christ. This is a man who had a revelation of Jesus. This was a man who was taken up into the heavens. This is a man who wrote most of the New Testament. This is a man who planted churches around the world and preached the gospel to multitudes in a day when there were no microphones and no motorized transport and no airplanes. This was a man who raised the dead. This was a man who healed the sick. This was the man who did mighty works. And yet he says, I've not yet attained. I've not yet arrived. I've still got somewhere to go. I'm still lacking. I still need to press forward. And if the apostle Paul could say this, how much more do I need to say, I'm not yet there. I'm going somewhere. How much more do all of us need to acknowledge that we have not yet arrived? You may have been in the faith for 20 years. You may be in a ministry for 30 years. You may be a prophet or an apostle or a general overseer or a pastor. You may be somebody special, but not a single one of us has arrived because God still has something more for you. 
You may have been to seminary. You may have been to cemetery. You may have a PhD or a DD or a THD. You may be so educated you don't know the right from the left and the front from the back, but there's still more for you. Do you believe God has something more? Because if you don't believe it, you'll never receive it. For Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone, tell your neighbor he's talking about you. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. You've got to believe today that God has something more for you. And some pastors and some leaders have stopped growing and stopped moving forward because they've stopped believing there's anything else. They think they've got it all. They think they know it all. I don't know it all. I don't have it all. I need help. I need Jesus. I need to press on and so do you. Somebody say amen. Amen. See, you can't receive what you don't believe exists. If you don't believe there's any more, you believe you know it all, you've done it all, you've seen it all, you can't receive anything new. That's the example we see from the little boy Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, the Bible tells us that the little boy did not know that God spoke. He did not know that there was a voice of God. In those days, the people of Israel were backslidden, and so the prophecies had died out, and the word of God was dying out in the hearts of the people, and they didn't know that God could speak. And into this wicked environment, Samuel was raised, he didn't know that God still speaks. Amen? And so one night he went down to lie on his bed and the, ho- the Holy Spirit spoke to him. Jehovah said, Samuel, Samuel. And he thought, I'm hearing my name. I'm hearing a voice. It must be Eli, my master. It must be the high priest in the tabernacle. So he jumped up and went to Eli and said, Eli, you called me. And Eli said, what are you talking about? It's nonsense. I didn't call you. You're hearing voices. You must have been dreaming dreams. You ate a bad kinke last night. Go back to bed. The little boy went back to sleep. Didn't know that God could speak, so he could not receive it. A second time, Jehovah said, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel jumped up and said, somebody's calling me. I know it's not a dream. It's not the kink I ate. He went up to the high priest and said, you called me. Eli said, I didn't call you. And suddenly then Eli remembered, in the days of time past, God used to speak in a prophetic voice. In the days and time past, he knew that he heard the voice of God. And suddenly Eli got stirred and said, wait a minute, I know who this is. It's not me calling. Perhaps this is the voice of the Almighty. Go back to bed. And if you hear it again, stand up and say, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. Speak to me. And Samuel said, what do you mean? You mean God talks? I didn't know God talks to man. I didn't know God could speak to me. I didn't know I could have a revelation. And when he got the revelation of the voice of God, he began to have a faith to believe it and receive it. And he went back to bed. And the third time Jehovah cried, Samuel, Samuel. And he jumped up and said, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. And God began to give him revelation. And I'm here to tell you today, there is a revelation for you. There is a power for you. There is an anointing for you. There is something come upon you. If you simply say, yes, Lord, Lord, I'm ready to receive it. Somebody shout, I believe. believe. The Bible tells us there's more. For Jewel 2.28 says, Then after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. And if you hear the voice of the Lord today, you will hear the prophetic word of Joel saying, There's something more. There's more of the spirit. There's more people. There are more nations. There are more villages. There are more places. There are more powers. There are more miracles. Somebody shout, out more. That's why 1 Corinthians 2 9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. You see, I've been in ministry since 1977. I've seen a lot of great things happen. I've seen souls get saved. I've seen the dead raised to life. I've seen blind eyes opened and deaf ears opened. I've seen God come down and deliver the demonically oppressed. I've seen marriages restored and churches planted and well drilled. I've seen God do signs and wonders and answers my prayer but my Bible says no matter what I've seen there's still more no matter what I've heard there's still more. No matter what God has put in my heart there's still more somebody shout there's more 
For Ephesians 3.20 says this, he is able to do exceeding abundantly above what we can ask or think. And I came to tell you today, no matter how big your prayers, no matter how big your vision, no matter how great your imagination, God says, there is more. Somebody say there is more. Because we serve a God who has no limit. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's the Almighty, everlasting, eternal God. Somebody shout, there's more. There's more. Even Jesus knew there was more. There was more for him. In John 10, 16, he said, I have sheep that are not of this fold. Them I must also bring. Jesus was seeing miracles in his ministry, but he knew there was more. more. In fact, the verse that amazes me is Isaiah 9, 7. It says, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Jesus' kingdom will never stop growing. Jesus' government will never stop growing. Even after we get to heaven, somehow there must be new worlds and new generations of people because God's kingdom will continually grow and grow. That's why I can shout, there is more. And the same thing for Jesus holds for you and I. For he said in John 14, 12, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with my Father. Somebody say there's more. There's more. That's why Peter preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 3, 19 to 21. Listen to his words. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then, somebody say then. Yes. Times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. So Peter said, there's going to come a time when you're going to be refreshed, and God's going to move in your midst, and then after that, I will send Jesus. But listen to this passage, for he, Jesus, must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. So here's what Peter said, I'm going to bless you. I'm I'm going to restore you. I'm going to minister to you. There will be an anointing. There will be a power. There will be a presence in worship that will overwhelm you. And then Jesus will come. But as long as there's something more, Jesus will remain in heaven. He must remain, the Bible says. He must remain in heaven until the final restoration of all things. So let me ask you today, has Jesus come again to earth? Has he come the second time? Has he split the heavens and sounded the trumpet and come? Has Jesus come or is he still in heaven? Because if he is still in heaven, there is something more. There's a time of restoration. There's a time of refreshment. There's something great still to be done. This was said by Peter, Peter who walked with Jesus for three years, Peter who saw the miracles, Peter who began to flow in the anointing, Peter who was in the upper room and received the Holy Spirit. This is the Peter who had miracles, signs, and wonders, yet he said, there is more. He told us Jesus must remain. Jesus can't come until the restoration of all things takes place. So first there must be the restoration then the return. First, there must be showers, then the sun. First, there must be an outpouring, then the appearing. First, the revival, then Christ's revealing. And that's why I'm passionate to tell you today there's more. There's more revival, more anointing, more power, more souls, more work, more things we must do before Jesus comes again. In fact, Haggai 2.9 says the future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And my vision of the church in the end times is a vision of a church so filled with his presence no one can stand. My vision of the church is greater than the greatest moment in Solomon's temple. My my vision of the church is greater than the spl splendor of all the past temples and tabernacles. My vision is that God will move in us, his people, his temple, in his men and women, and that we will be consumed in his presence so we can't stand in our own strength, but we stand in him. That's why we must press on. So let me give you three ways you must press on. First of all, you've got to press on to the person of Jesus. That's what Paul says in our 
passage in Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Listen to how he proceeds it. Yes, Paul said, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ. Just say, I want to know Christ. I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. And listen to Paul's passion today. When he said there's something more, he said, I'm pressing on. He begins by pressing on to the person of Jesus. He said, I got to know him. I want to share in every intimate detail of his life. I want to know his power, and I want to know how he feels. I want to know his love. I even want to know his suffering and the Holy Spirit says to you today what you've been passing through that nobody knows about the tears you've cried in secret at night is because God is letting you share in his suffering so you can share in his heart he's bringing you close so you can know him and experience the power of his resurrection so this is what we're called to in that passionate devotion to press under Christ. We're called to put the master before the ministry. We're called to put the personal relationship with Jesus before our preaching. We're called to put the alpha and omega before our outreach. In these dark and troubled times, the only way we can survive in ministry is not by focusing on our ministry, but by focusing on our master. We gotta get close to Jesus and hear his heartbeat and look to him. For there are distractions and betrayals and disturbances. There's condemnation and criticism and fault finding. There's judgment and all kinds of wicked things, even in the church, even in your own church. There are some people talking about you. I know because they call me every day and complain. <laughs> but we gotta keep our eyes on Jesus. For Hebrews 12, 1 to 3 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything, every discouragement, every betrayal, every sin, every weight that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance. Let us press on the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. How do we press on? We press on to the person of Christ. We press on by keeping our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Tell your neighbor, consider him. Who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. If you keep your eyes on Jesus and keep pressing to him, though the storms come, though the opposition comes, though the discouragement will come, you will not grow weary. You will run your race and win. That's a lesson we can learn from a man named Eamon Coughlin. Back in March 6, 1987, Eamon Coughlin was the Irish runner who held the world championship record holder in the 1500 meters race. He was competing in the World Track Championship in Indianapolis, USA, and he was in one of the preliminary heats, the knockout stage, if you would, trying to make it to the finals and once again keep the world record. With two and a half laps left, however, Eamon Coughlin was tripped as he ran. Someone stuck their foot out, he fell somehow, and he was down. It looked as if his run for glory was over. But Eamon got up, and with great effort, he got back into the race. He kept running, and with only 20 meters left, he now positioned himself in third place. He passed everybody, but there were two ahead of him. But it was okay. The first three what runners would make it to the next stage. He knew if he could just come in third, perhaps he felt he'd done enough. Perhaps he felt pain from where he fell. Perhaps he felt discouraged, or perhaps he felt like, thank God, I made it. But for whatever reason, as he was in third place nearing the finish line, Eamon Coughlin turned and saw that no one was around him, so he relaxed. He eased up. 
Without knowing it, another runner was coming on his other side. He hadn't noticed him, and this runner put on the brave display of a final burst of power and passed Eamon Coughlin, and the world record holder didn't make the finals. He came in fourth because he took his eyes off the prize. It's tempting to many of us to reach a certain level in ministry and become satisfied. I mean, I've got my crowd. I'm well-liked. The money coming in is enough to pay my rent and my kids' school fees, and everything seems copacetic. But God says when we take our eyes off of him and take our eyes off the prize, we falter and we lose our way. The word author in Hebrews 12 literally means chief leader. In other words, Jesus is the one who leads us to victory. And the closer we get to him, the closer we get to victory. The word perfecter of our faith means completeness. And Jesus is calling you today not to settle, not to give up, not to be content with what you've done, not to rest on your laurels, but to keep pressing on. Press on to know him. A few years ago, I told the deacons it was time for me to retire. They told me, no, I haven't been too happy with them since. But today, I'm recommitting myself to press on. And I want to challenge you to recommit yourself to press on. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's what we learned from Peter. We all know the story in Matthew 14, about three in the morning, the Bible says Jesus was out walking on the water. Peter saw him and said, if it's you, call me. And so Jesus called him and Peter got out of the boat. He stepped out on water and walked on the water. Hallelujah. But then he started looking at the storm around him and the Bible says he began to sink. He began to go under. When he diverted his attention from Jesus, he went under. And then Jesus said, don't be afraid, take courage. And he picked him up and put him back in the boat. And so often we focus on the fact that Peter sank. We focus on the fact that he fell down. But the fact is, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, Peter walked on water. As long as he kept pressing into Jesus, he walked on water and did miracles. And no matter the storm, no matter what you face, I'm here to declare to you today, you are going to make it. You are going to keep pressing on. You're going to go forward. You're going to walk on water. Things are going to be done in your life and ministry that no one has heard of before. God is going to do miracles signs and wonders in you and through if you only keep your eyes on Jesus. So lift your hand and say, I am pressing on to the person of Jesus Christ. And then number two, press on to your purpose. Listen to what Paul says in verse 12. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul here declares, I'm pressing on to Christ and I'm pressing on to my purpose. He knew that he'd been called. He'd been captured. He'd been anointed for a purpose. There was a reason Jesus took hold of him. And he said, I'm going on for that purpose. I'm pressing on. And the same is true for you. After your relationship with Jesus, Jesus, you need to know you've got a call on your life. You've got a purpose. Every man and woman in this room today is called. Every one of you has a purpose. You've got a gift. You've got an anointing. You're extraordinary. You're vessels of honor. You are the people that God has called. He's using you and he's going to do greater things in you. I'm so thankful for the lives of the men and women in this room and I look at you, some of you from a distance and I rejoice at what God has done and I rejoice at what God is doing because you've got a purpose so in the dark days when people are complaining and in the dark days when they're criticizing keep your eyes on Jesus and keep your eyes on your purpose for you weren't created to please people you were created to live for an audience of one you don't need the applause of men you need the applause of heaven and right now heaven is standing up and cheering for you heaven is standing up and rejoicing the angels are clapping for you Somebody say the angels are clapping for me. Sometimes we get discouraged, but listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.1. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Since we have a ministry, we don't lose heart. If you keep your eyes on your ministry, you won't lose heart. If you keep your eyes on your purpose, you won't lose heart. So lift your hand and say, God has called me. I will fulfill his plan for my life. Nothing can stop me. No power can hinder me. The only thing that can keep me from my destiny is if I quit. And I'm not a quitter. 
I will cross the finish line. I will succeed in Jesus' name. When I say keep your eyes on the ministry, I'm not saying keep your eyes on the results. I'm saying keep your eyes on the work God called you to do. Because sometimes you don't see results for a long time. Sometimes it takes time for that fruit to grow. And here's something God wants to speak to you right now. This is in my notes, but it's by the Holy Ghost. Some of your best fruit will grow on someone else's tree. Some of your best fruit will grow on someone else's tree. And people say, oh, look at him, look at him. Not knowing that if not for you, there would be no him. And you can't base your pride or your success on what you see from your own results because some of the seeds you've planted, some of the seeds you've planted are going to become mighty oak trees, mighty popo trees, mighty trees that will bear so much fruit. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you. Doing great things for God begins by doing little things faithfully. To fulfill your purpose requires faithfulness. That's why the Bible says in John chapter 8, 31, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you have to be faithful where you are because sometimes your dream takes you to a pit. Sometimes your vision will take you to a hidden place. Sometimes you'll be in a secret, lonely place and it looks like nobody is watching. But I guarantee you, there's a father in heaven who is watching you and he's looking at you. You may be stuck in a temporary building. You may be stuck in a rented place. You may be struggling to make ends meet, but God sees you. And if you will be faithful, he will raise you up. Every seed you sow is bearing fruit. Every seed you sow is taking root. Every seed you sow is growing up. Your potential can only manifest when it has time to mature. Your purpose can only be fulfilled when you remain faithful where God plants you. The problem today is some men are so busy chasing opportunity. They're never in one place long enough to put down roots and grow fruit. Without roots, your tree can't go tall. You'll easily be pulled up. But when you start walking in faithfulness and press on to your purpose in life, you're guaranteed to succeed. Don't look at results. Keep focused on your purpose and do it faithfully. That's the lesson we can learn from a man named John Eglin. John Eglin was a deacon in the Methodist church way back in England, in Colchester, England. And on the morning of Sunday, January 6th, 1850, there was a terrible snowstorm in Colchester, England. Now, if you've never been in snow, you won't realize it, but snow prevents people from traveling, much like the heavy rains and the flooding in Accra. And so the snow came that morning, and it seemed to cover the whole area, and people thought, there's no point in going to church. It won't hold. It's not possible. A few people, though, struggled to church, and one of them was John Eglin. John Eglin was a deacon, and he believed uh, that he should be faithful to what God had called him to do. So he got up and went to church in spite of the snowstorm. When he got there, there were 12 people. The pastor couldn't come. Other deacons couldn't come. Only 12 people. And because there were no other leaders but him, Deacon John Eglin was in charge of the service. And some of the members said, let's just cancel and go home. The snowstorm is too great. But Deacon John said, no, we've gathered. Let's have service. Let's be faithful. Because a faithful man does what he can where he is with what he has. Even though Deacon John Eglin had never preached before, he stood up that morning and preached. He talked for 10 minutes He stuttered and stammered and rambled on, and it seemed like his message was a train wreck. At the end, though, he gave an altar call for salvation, and of the 12 people, one boy, a 15-year-old boy, came forward. A 15-year-old boy gave his life to Christ. Deacon John Eglin prayed for him, and they closed the service. But that's not the end of the story, because that 15-year-old boy was a man named Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And that little boy grew up in the church and eventually got a call into ministry. Charles Haddon Spurgeon went into ministry and was faithful to Christ. He started 50 other churches. Eventually, he became the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England, a church with over 5,000 people every Sunday in a day when there were no microphones or horn speakers. He's known as one of the greatest preachers of all time. 
Charles Haddon Spurgeon became England's greatest preacher. His writing influenced me, and if you've been influenced by my preaching, you've been influenced by Charles Spurgeon and the faithful service of Deacon John Eglin. So here's what you need to remember. If you will remain faithful, some of your best fruit may grow on other people's trees, but God counts it as your effort and your reward. And if God wants to use you to raise up other people who he uses in more visible ways, let the will of God be done. If you will serve God faithfully, he will increase your impact and influence beyond your own ability. For Jesus said in Luke 16, 10, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in much. And today, we can all follow the example of Deacon John Eglin. Be faithful right where you are. In spite of the storm, press on to Jesus and press on to your purpose. Do what you can with what you have where you are and let God multiply you. The problem today is many of us are more interested in holding the microphone than we are in serving the master. Tell your neighbor he's talking about you. Oh, please, if you're a wife by your husband, don't, don't do that. It could cause some trouble. <laughs> Dorothy, please. Oh, thank you. But listen to what the G- what Bible says in Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So even Jesus didn't come to hold the microphone. He's not looking for stars and celebrities. He's looking for servants. He requires faithfulness. And when we're faithful, he uses us. Listen to some entries from the diary of that great apostle, John Wesley. John Wesley, who started the Methodist church. Sunday, May 5th morning, I preached at St. Anne's, was asked not to come back anymore. Sunday night, May 5th, I preached in St. John's. The deacon said, get out and stay away. Sunday, May 12th morning, I preached in St. Jude's. Can't go back there either. Sunday morning, May 19th, I preached in St. Somebody Else's. The deacons called a special meeting afterwards and said I should not return. Sunday night, May 19th, I preached on the street and got kicked off the street. Sunday morning, May 26th, I preached in a meadow. The farmer let a bull out of the barn and he chased me out of the meadow. Sunday morning, June 2nd, I preached on the edge of town and was kicked off the highway. Sunday night, June 2nd, I preached in a pasture. 10,000 people came to hear me. See, John Wesley kept his destiny in view. He didn't allow popular opinion and people's applause to divert him. When he was asked not to come back, when he was told he couldn't speak, when he was kicked out of a field and off the street, he kept his purpose in view and he kept on preaching. And God blessed him with thousands. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 25, 21, his master replied, well done, a equal, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And that brings us to our third truth today. You've got to press on to the prize. Philippians 3.14 ends in this way. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And I want to tell you, there is a great reward headed your way. There is a prize coming that is greater than you can imagine. There is a trophy and a crown that God is going to bless you with. And you can go for that prize because it's going to be your offering that you lay at his feet. You can understand today that Jesus talked a lot about reward. He talks a lot about his father blessing those who've served him faithfully. Because at heaven, when we get there, the only thing we can give him to show our appreciation is our praise and our reward. The Bible says we will take the gold crowns and cast them down. We will take the trophies and cast them down and say, Jesus, this one is for you. All that we have and all that we are belongs to him. And I know when I get to heaven, my heart will long to give him something. My heart will be bursting to say, Jesus, Take this. I want to bless you. I want to give you thanks. And it's the crown I will receive that I can give him. It's the trophy I will earn that I can give him. That's why you've got to keep your eyes on the prize. 
For when I keep my eyes on the prize, I can resist the devil and his ways. When I keep my eyes on the prize, I can endure persecution and betrayal. When I keep my eyes on the prize, I can overcome temptation and slam the door on the devil. For even though the road is long, it's not too rough. And though the mountain is high, it's not too steep. And though the storm is blowing, it's not too tough. When I keep my eyes on the person of Jesus, and I keep my eyes on my purpose in Christ, and I keep my eyes on the the prize. I will not give up. I will not turn back. And though a thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my other hand, I will not fear. I will not turn back. I will not give in. I keep my eyes on the prize. For one day, the shores of this life will fade away. And one day, I will see it. I will see the heavenly Jerusalem coming. One day, one day, I will see the streets of gold. One day, I will see my Savior who died for me. One day, one day and though I can't see him now I keep my eyes on the prize somebody shout press on on. for when you adjust your focus you get power to overcome that's why Paul said in Colossians 3 to set your affections on things above keep your eyes on the prize not on things on the earth for me my dream home is not in a Jingano or East Legon. My dream car is not a Lexus or a BMW. My dream home is in the heavenly Jerusalem. <sighs> and my dream car is a chariot with the angels driving me. My dream vacation is not to sit on the beach at Pram Pram. It's to walk the streets of gold. So take the world and all its pleasure. I have a more enduring treasure. I'm going to press on. Press on. Press on. Press on. That's why Paul said, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. That's the lesson we can learn from Stella. Stella was an athlete, a young lady who ran in South Africa, and she was on a 4 by 100 relay team. They were pretty good. In fact, they started winning races locally. Then they won races regionally. They went on to win so many races that they were invited to a national competition. The great day came when they were competing in the 4 by 100 women's relay race. It looked like they had a pretty good chance to win. They were in a huge crowd in a stadium filled with people, and the track was good, the air was good, the weather was good, and they sized up the competition and thought they had a good chance to win. The great day arrived, and suddenly it was their turn. Stella was the last runner, number four in the 4x100, and as the gun sounded, the first runner took off, and Stella's teammate, the first runner, was able to creep ahead and get a little bit ahead of all the others and handed off the baton to the second runner. And then the second runner on Stella's team was able to take that baton and run even further and get a little bit further ahead. And then she passed off the baton to the third, to third runner and the third runner took it and was able to fly with the wind and a lead opened up and the crowd was cheering. It looked like there was no way that Stella's team would lose. Everything was on course. They would be South Africa's national champions if she could just grab the baton and run her race. And as the third runner on Stella's team reached out to hand Stella the baton, somehow it fell. They missed the connection and the baton went to the ground and rolled off. Stella panicked and froze and she realized she had to get it or the race was over. So she ran off the track and stumbled after the baton. But when she got there, she accidentally kicked it and it went further and she went to grab it and went further and Before she knew it, she grabbed the baton and turned and looked, and every single other team had passed her. They went from first to worst. In that moment, she just wanted to sit down on the grass and weep. Victory had been denied at the last moment. It was all on her. But then she heard something miraculously. Out of this big stadium of all the thousands of people there, she was sure she could hear the voice of her mother. She could hear her mother crying, Go, Stella, go! Go, Stella, go! And with that, 
with that voice in her ears and that motivation in her heart, she got up and got back on the track and started running. She kept her eyes on the prize. She kept going and she ran like the wind. She put her heart into it and suddenly other people in the stadium started shouting, go Stella, go! Go Stella, go! She ran with all of her might. She passed one runner, then she passed another runner, then she passed another runner. Now the entire stadium was on its feet. They were shouting, go Stella, go! Go Stella, go! Go Stella, go! There were just a few yards left, a few meters to the end, and there was one final runner. Stella gave it her entire energy and effort. She reached out with her hands as the crowd cheered, as the wind blew. Stella gave one last effort and passed the final runner and cut the rope and won the race as the crowd shouted, Go, Stella, go. Maybe you're here and you've dropped the baton. Maybe you're here and someone else dropped it. You were doing so well and then COVID hit. You were doing so well and then terrorist threat. You were doing so well and then the economy. You were doing so well and then your member got transferred, the one who paid the tithe. You were doing so well. The baton is dropped and it looks like it's over. But if you tune your ear I think you'll hear something today. You'll hear the sound of Jesus shouting, go, go, go. You'll hear the sound of the saints shouting, go, go, go. You'll hear the sound of the angels shouting, go, go, go. You'll hear Paul shouting, go, go, go. You'll hear them shout your name, go. So pick up that baton. Get back in the race. Press on to the person of Jesus. Press on to your purpose and press on to the prize. May God bless you. 